All right, we've got Lauren here and we've got Carol here. Welcome everyone. Um, so we're gonna do it kind of like we did last week where um, Carol and Karen are gonna talk for a few minutes and I think Carol has maybe some questions to ask her. And then um, we will open it up for anyone that has questions and pull you up on stage. So Carol, I will let you begin. And then at the end, we usually go until about seven o'clock. And at seven o'clock, we're going to switch over to Cameo for any of you who were interested in doing that, where we can see Lauren, hopefully, if we get this working right, and me. I'm talking with my microphone. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> I'm just talking away. Oh, gosh. So uh, we're going to be doing this until 7 o'clock, and then at 7 o'clock, we will hop over to Cameo.com. And I, did you already talk about that, Deb? No, I have not. Okay. So on Cameo, we can actually see each other, and those who have a front row ticket can actually be pulled up on stage so everybody can see you and hear your question, but we'll do that at 7. So I, I was late coming to this one because I realized I never sent the questions to Lauren that I was going to ask her tonight. So this is going to be, she doesn't, didn't, <laughs> she didn't get a minute to, to prepare for this. I, I apologize. So today we have Lauren Buckingham. She is from the UK. And um, well, maybe first, Lauren, tell us where you are from. Um, so I am actually from, uh, originally from a town in England called Wolverhampton, um, and then more recently my family moved to Staffordshire, so we're kind of towards the Welsh border, um, about three hours north of London. And what, and what made you decide to devote so much of your time to protecting big cats? Um, so I actually uh, originally started out, you know, as many kids do, wanting to be a vet. Um, and then the more I went through, I decided that wasn't really a career path for me. Um, and I ended up going to university and did an animal behavior and wildlife biology degree. Um, after that, I was looking more into the kinds of animals that I wanted to work with. Um, and exotics really kind of took precedence over domestics. Um, and the more I started to learn, you know, about the issues that face these animals in the wild, whether it be, you know, the gorillas or the big cats, um, I really wanted to learn more about conservation and more about how people could help. Um, so after university, I actually started looking for jobs um, and really struggled to find anywhere that would take me in um, with the qualifications, but without the experience. Um, so actually, when I found Big Cat, it was one of the few places that allowed you to go and to learn about the animals and work with the animals and learn more about the mission. Because really, in the UK, private ownership and that sort of thing is not a well talked about subject. So there's a lot of things before I came here that I, same as many people, was very unaware of, didn't realize how big of an issue it was. Um, and then it was actually through my time at Big Cat that I really found where I wanted to go with my life and the animals that I wanted to work with. When was that? Um, so I actually started interning in 2013. 2013. And yeah. how did you actually hear about Big Cat Rescue? So I actually went to university with a girl who interned for you guys. Um, well, for us, I guess. Um, and she came and did a three-month program. Um, and I was sat in a lecture one day and she was wearing her Big Cat Rescue intern shirt. And so I saw her shirt and then started, you know, looking online, researching. And that's when I found out, you know, about the internship and how to get involved. Um, I applied, never thought it would happen. And then actually uh, got an email back asking if I could start in two weeks. So it all happened very fast, but it was probably the best, one of the best decisions I've ever made. And when you did that, had you ever been away from home? Um, so I was away from home for university. I lived in a different, uh, different town um, and I did, my degree was uh, three years long. So in that sense, yes, but um, I was never in a different country. How long were you an intern for? 
Um, so I intend on and off for around two years. Um, I only ever planned on being at Big Cat for three months. And then after three months, I went home um, and I just kind of had the conversation with my mom that I needed to come back. And, you know, I wanted to learn more and work with more animals. And I met some of my best friends here. Um, and so I was like, you know, I, I need to go back and I need to do more and I need to help more. And so um, I went home for three months, worked, made more money until I could come back again to do the level two internship. Um, and then actually through the process of interning, um, there was myself and a couple others that kind of just refused to leave. So they kept making different levels and higher levels that included more. Um, and I went all the way through to level five, um, which was kind of the highest level of internship, learning you know, how to coordinate and do meds and um, all that kind of stuff. So by the time I finished, I think I'd pretty much done everything available. I know for the longest time, we only had first, we only had two levels, and then we only had yes. three for a long time. And then we had so many people like you that just kept coming back. Yeah, <laughs> we we had refused to, to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what brought you up on my radar was that you were getting more people to make the call of the wild after their tour to contact Congress and ask them to support the Big Cat Public Safety Act than probably all the rest of the volunteers and interns together. <laughs> Tell me or tell everybody what that was and why it was that you, or how it was that you were so good at that. Um, so I think a big part of it was the accent. Uh, people really like my accent for some reason. They seem to think it makes me friendly. But um, so the uh, Call of the Wild was something that we would have um, tour guests do when they would get back from tours. We would talk to them all about the federal bill. Uh, the Big Cat Public Safety Act and how important it was for, you know, not only captive big cats, but also for big cats globally. Um, and we would ask them to take some, some time at the end of their tour. We would take them, show them the board of representatives and senators, find the uh, rep or senator for their zip code. Um, and then we would actually help them there and then make the call of the wild um, while still on site because we figured you know a lot of people when they leave it's very easy to forget about it or to get distracted or just to not do it or get confused and um, so it was really a chance for us to get people to take action there and then at the end of the tour um, so we would spend you know a whole hour and a half kind of telling them the reasons they should do it and how they can help and I think it was a great way for a lot of people to feel useful um, I feel like a lot of time, you know, we tell people the problems in the world, but we don't give them solutions. So I think for a lot of guests, you know, it, it really gave them a way to feel as though they had helped. Um, and so, you know, to us, being a big cat and seeing these issues firsthand and working with animals that have been through this, um, I think it was almost easier for us to talk to people about it because we had seen it. Um, and so, you know, it was something that at the end of the tour, I was very passionate about and I wanted people to help in any way possible and senators and reps to hear how important it was and that they should take action. Um, and yeah, it just turned out to be something. Um, funnily enough, I am not really a people person, so it really pushed me out of my comfort zone, but it was something that meant something to me. So I was more than happy to kind of do that. You're so soft-spoken, and I, I can imagine how hard that would be for you to, you're, you're directing a, a, you know, this tour of 20 people to try and get them to make this call, so it's not something you can do very quietly. Um, and that's one of the things I miss the most about not having tours, is that that was such a great opportunity at the end of every tour to get as many people as you possibly could to make that call, and now we are relying yeah. entirely on the social media people to make yeah. people do that yeah I will say it was um I think for a lot of the interns um myself included you know tours when I first started were a hundred percent spoken we didn't have the Vox systems we didn't have the automated stories so we really had to um prep and learn and know what we were talking about um but honestly like from interns that I've seen over the years I think it gave so many people 
confidence and gave them, you know, a platform that they could feel comfortable. Um, and I, I, I don't think if I would have not had to do that, I don't know if I would have been so confident with speaking to people and, you know, getting the message out there. So it was, um, it was definitely a learning curve, but I think when it's something you're so passionate about and when you get that response from people and you get the willingness from people, it kind of eggs you on to do more each day. So that was, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. That's an interesting perspective. Nobody's ever said that before to me. Um, did you go straight from intern to, vol- uh, to staff or did you go through the volunteer program? Um, so I actually went uh, straight from intern. Well, I had a couple days um, where I was a volunteer that uh, when I first came out on my work visa, um, because I wasn't legal, legally allowed to start work until a set date. Um, so for two weeks prior, I was volunteering. But for the most part, I went directly from intern to staff. And can you talk a little bit about how painful that immigration pro- process was for you? What, what do you mean? It was so easy. <laughs> um, um, so it was probably the most stressful six years of my life. Um, thankfully, it six is all years. Now. Yeah, six years. I went through it. Um, but, you know, thankfully, it's over now and I have my green card and I'm good from here on out. Um But yeah, basically the way that I came over here um, was through the H-1B work visa. Um, So uh, Carol and Howard very graciously agreed to be my sponsor for that. Um, And I had to go through a whole application process where um, we had to basically prove to uh, the U.S. immigration why I was the best person to do the job that I was doing. Um, which was the conservation stuff based on my degree. Um, So actually, when we first applied, it was a lottery. So for, uh, I think, the year I applied, there were 270,000 applicants and and only 70,000 possible spots. Wow. Um, So we put the application in, crossed everything, crossed fingers, crossed toes, And um, actually on the last day that we could get a receipt through, we got one. Um, And that's not to say that those 70,000 people got the visa. It's just to say that their application would be selected for processing. Um, So we went through that initially um, and everything went through and it was great. And I moved here in 2015 to start as staff. And then we actually had to do the whole process again three years later to extend my visa. Um, But but during that time, uh, they actually decided for some reason that my visa wasn't eligible and gave me 10 days to leave. So right in the middle of my job with, you know, my job, my house, my animals, everything else, um, I basically had to up and leave, go back to England for three months and reapply. Um to get my visa extension, reapplied, went through the process. And then um, when I was in England, they had absolutely no issue, approved it, and I was able to come back. Wow. So, what a yeah, scary that, time, though. Yeah, and it was. I mean, for six years, you know, not knowing really what the next day is going to bring um, and not knowing, you know, whether or not you're going to be asked to leave or whether things are going to change or whether there's going to be a reason that you have to, you know, return to the UK. Um, And then, yeah, so then this year I was able to go through the green card process. So now I'm a uh, permanent resident, which makes life a lot easier. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, I couldn't have done that without you guys um, and I wouldn't have been here without you guys. So that's something I will forever be grateful for. Well, you serve us so well and you do so much for the cats that we were happy to do it. But let me tell you, we did not want to start that process because we had actually gone through that process with Chris Poole. And it it took, like you said, years and really yeah. expensive immigration attorneys. This is not something anybody would ever be able to process on their own, I don't think. No. And it... 
it was just nightmarish, the amount of work that went into it. And then as soon as we got Chris over here legally, he decided that he was burned out and didn't want to work for us anymore. And so when my, my, my mother was the one who processed his application and went through all of that with him, and she said, I don't ever, ever want you to hire anybody from any foreign country. Because the premise of the immigration permit is if you're bringing somebody in from outside of your country or outside of the United States anyway, they have to be the only person who can do that job and that there's nobody in the entire United States that could possibly do that job. And the way we were able to do that with Chris was to say, well, you know, in order to film our cats, somebody has to be able to be right up against the side of the cage. So they have to be somebody who has been through our entire training program to be close enough to the cats to do that. And it has to be somebody that knows what they're doing with, with the camera. And so that's how we were able to get Chris. And with you, what really made it possible with you was the fact you had already done the groundwork of getting that degree in the same area that we needed you in, which was vetting all of our conservation projects. So, it, you know, if you had not done that, we never would have been able to even start the process. So thank you for having the foresight to know what you wanted to do with your life as a kid. Oh, yeah, I totally planned, totally planned all of it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it all, honestly, it was one of those things that it seemed to all fit and all seemed to fall into place. Um, so the entire process, it was just having that belief that it was going to work itself out. Um, you know, I mean, initially when we were told that there were 70,000 spots for 200 and whatever thousand people, I was like, I don't stand a chance. Um, so the fact that that even happened in the first place told me that, you know, this is something that's supposed to happen <laughs> and just to have faith and it'll happen. And it did. So I'm, I'm glad it all worked out. Tell everybody what you do as our conservation director. So um, I am probably one of the few people at the sanctuary that gets to spend money as opposed to making money. Um, but each year I get given a budget um, to basically donate to in situ conservation projects globally. So that can be you know here in the US, domestic donations, or it can be international, which is a larger portion of what we spend. Um, but basically, I find projects that are doing on the ground work to directly benefit cats of all species uh, in their natural wild habitats. Um, so that can be anything from, you know, the larger tigers, tigers lions, jaguars, um, all the way down to some of the smallest cats, the rusty spotted cats, palace cats. Um, and I just, a lot of my time actually is spent uh, trying to search out projects that may not be well known that are doing great work but don't have the outreach of some of the bigger organizations um just to see you know how we can assist them and get their projects off the ground um we in recent years have started working with a lot of small cat projects um small cat conservation only gets about one percent of funding um, all available funding, the other 99% goes to the more well-known big cats. Um, so we try and kind of fill that void and help them where possible. Um, we have a, a gentleman who is actually a great help to us. His name is Jim Sanderson, and he is a small cat specialist. Um, and he will kind of help guide in the direction of projects that he knows are happening and that need help. Um, but we really just try to provide financial assistance where possible. Um, obviously, our fund is not as large as some of the others. You know, the Mohammed bin Zayed Fund or the Disney Conservation Fund, they have a lot larger numbers to work with. Um, so rather than acting as a main funding source, a lot of the time we will act as like bridge funding. So if there is a project that has one of these larger grants and they are in the project or in the process, sorry, of applying for a future grant. Uh, sometimes we can be the bridge funding between those two grants to ensure they can stay in the field and continue the work that they're doing uh, without having a break, you know, which could affect their work. Um, but yeah, I go through and I just ensure that the projects we're looking at are in line with our mission so that the work they're doing, you know, is genuinely helping the cats, that they're not putting out the wrong message, that they're not using ambassador animals. 
um, that they're non-contact. You know, we we don't want to a kind of you know make them think that that kind of behavior is okay. Um, so we try and really look for projects that are in line with what we do as a sanctuary and our um, kind of focus as a sanctuary. So um, that can be anything from a couple hundred dollars all the way up to, um, I think actually just for International Tiger Day, we sent almost $30,000. So the um, it can really range in funding just based on what the projects need. And usually that's about $100,000 a year. Yes, yeah, so we actually, when I first started in 2015, um, we donated, I actually have the numbers up here. Uh, in 2015, we donated $29,000. And then each year that has continued to grow. Um, and then last year in 2020, uh, we donated over $100,000. And it's probably going to be close to the same again this year. Um, so, you know, we have, or I have my own budget through the sanctuary and then we also have additional funds from things like the wildcat walkabout international tiger day that are all additional fundraisers um, that allow us to donate more because of donors and supporters and followers um, you know so they are, really are a, a big chunk of allowing me to support these projects in march of last year because we had to close our gates due to covid and all of the crazies from tiger king we ended up having to let go half of our staff, which meant all of us had to take on an extra job. And your extra job turned out to be our immersive video editor, which you may have been doing even before that. Um, can you tell people what you do for that job? Yeah, um, so that was a whole new skill set. Um, I had never done any kind of filming or video editing prior. Um, but basically, Aside from our regular videos that we, you know, put out through YouTube and Facebook, um, we wanted to provide a platform for virtual reality videos. So basically 3D, 180, 360, um, that people, you know, can drop on a headset and feel as though they are their first person with the cats or with the keepers and um, to give people a more personalized one-on-one -on -one experience. Um, so way back in the beginning, we were actually very fortunate to go to a YouTube boot camp in California. Um, we went out there and learned the basic skills of 3D editing and video. Um, the rest, I had a great teacher called YouTube and Google. They were wonderful. Um, so I kind of went and taught myself a lot of how to do things um, and then tried to transfer the skills I'd learned over to filming the cats. Um, so each week we try and put out a new immersive video that can really give people an alternative to going to a zoo or going to see these animals in an, a, a, an environment that's exploitive, exploitive, exploitative, whatever the word is. Um, so it basically gives them an alternative that they can sit at home, they can, you know, be in schools, they can be in hospital, they can be wherever and they can still get the feeling that they are there with the animals and learn about the animals. Um, so over the past year or so, we've tried to build a YouTube channel that called 360 Big Cats, where you can find all those kinds of videos and also with the Oculus headset. Um, so you can just get another view and, as I said, feel as though you're really there with the cats. Today was the first day in weeks that I have had time to put on the headset and check out your videos. And so I had four of them in the queue that I hadn't seen yet. And so I got to spend the end of my day going through uh, Manny rubbing around on spices and the grooming session with Brittany. That was fantastic. And um, what else did I see? Jasmine swimming, I think. And I yep. forget what the fourth one was, but they were really, really good. And it's a, a great way for people to see these cats in a way that would be not safe for any of us to see them because it's the camera yes. being put at peril, not a person. Yeah. And I will say they, uh, animals really are not like filming people. Um, you have to definitely have your wits about you and be able to second guess what they're going to do. Um, some cats more than others. So, you know, it really helps uh, my experience as a keeper and going through and learning 
all of the um you know cleaning and feeding keeper lessons and having that experience prior to filming was definitely a huge huge help and um, being able to understand the cats before adding the third element to that um and also you know when we went to to the studio to the youtube conference uh, one of the things they told us is okay so you want to film somewhere that's quiet somewhere that's indoors somewhere where you can have your subject within six feet of you and somewhere that you can have a microphone and I was like cool so we we can't do any of those things <laughs> so, <laughs> you know you're basically standing there and they're like you have to do this this is and this and so we left and we were like well the cats are outside it's sunny they won't stand still and if we have a microphone, they're probably going to try and eat it. So, yeah, we kind of had to become, you know, very experimental and try and figure out ways to film them. And we went through a couple different types of cameras, styles of cameras, until we found one that worked. Um, and then, of course, the company that makes that camera now doesn't make them anymore. So, yeah, so we'll just progress with it. But um, it's definitely been a real fun skill to learn. And it gives me a break from uh, staring at a computer screen all day. So I get to go hang out with the cats and film them and make fun videos and hopefully give people something they enjoy watching. And that actually leads me to the last thing I'm going to say. It's not a question, but an observation. And then I'll hand it off to Deb and Karen. But that is that when we did personality testing, you were, I think, the only person on our staff who tested as an Enneagram 3, which is the achiever. And the thing I love about you is that if I want something done, all I have to say is, Lauren, do you think you can figure this out? And that's the end of it. I don't have to make tutorial videos for you. I don't have to go figure it out for you and then tell you, you're the achiever. You will go out there and figure it out on your own. And so I really love that about you. And thank you so much for everything you've done for me and for the cats. Well, thank you. Deb, I can just, uh, I know that we only have 30 minutes left. This is Karen. Um, so I'll be quick because we all know how many questions I could possibly have. So we're not going to do that to you, Lauren. Um, I wanted to, first of all, thank you. I don't know if you remember me because we never formally met, but you were trying to get Kimba to, um, I, I, I guess, do um, operant training when I was there with my family in June. Um, yeah. I sponsor him. And he just was not having it at all. So you really gave it a good, good try because he's my sponsor cat. And at the level um, that I sponsor, I guess everyone gets that treat to have some operant training. But um, he was being very stubborn that day, which we all know he, he can be. So um, I'm going to have just a quick question. It even could be a one word answer from you. Okay. Who's your, who's your favorite cat? So um, my favorite cat for most of my time while I was at Big Cat was Sundari. Um, she will always be my cat. Um, and now I actually, the one that I probably have the most draw to is Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine Tiger to me just has such a quirky, unusual personality. Um, she's one of those cats that, you know, you can just go out and talk to her and she's rolling around and silly and um, but she definitely also has her scary side. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think she's probably my favorite cat currently at the sanctuary. Um, but Sundari will always be my favorite. Well, thank you for answering that. And thank you for the day that we were there. It was very appreciative. You are very, very welcome. You're a very sweet person. And Deb, I know if you um, want to pull down, I think that we have Daniel next. But... I will hand it over to you. I have a quick question first, Lauren. Okay. Tell me about your pets at home. <laughs> so um, I have multiple fur babies. Um, I have two dogs currently um, and then a couple cats. Uh, my dogs were both rescues. So I have a 60 pound pit bull who is the biggest marshmallow you will ever meet. Her name is Suki. Um, and then I also have a, they said she's a German Shepherd mix, but I'm not so sure. Um, she's smaller. Her name is Kalua, and she is eight years old. So she's the older lady. Um, and then my cats were actually from Big Cat. 
Um, I actually bottle raised them, domestic cats, when they were just a couple ounces. Um, actually, during my internship, um, their names are Evie and Piper, and we uh, we bottle raised them from eight ounces and then couldn't let them go. So they were foster fails that now live with us. I've seen your pets on your Facebook page and I knew you had several so I know that everybody always likes to know tell us about your pets at home <laughs> so. yeah yeah well and it's it's also very difficult because my partner actually works for the county shelter uh, so daily I get hey look at this dog hey look at this cat and I'm like that's nice <laughs> like they, they can go live with somebody else <laughs> they can't live with us we're full um <laughs> But no, it's definitely um, my fur kids are, are a huge part of our life. So um, thank you for asking that question. I'm always happy to share them with people. <laughs> All right, Daniel, you are first up. Did you, you have a question or a comment for Lauren? Actually, I have a comment and a question. I'll, I'll mention the comment first up. Lauren, I love your eye. You have a really good eye when it comes to taking the videos. Like uh, you always get this, these immensely beautiful shots of the cats um i don't know how you do it but uh i just wanted to thank you for your videography and just, just the care you put into every little thing with the cats well thank you i appreciate that uh, and here's the question it's a little silly but um you come from the land of england which is ruled by a queen and you work at a place that's ruled by a queen uh so what's it like being in her royal line lioness's presence <laughs> um nikki is probably one of the most incredible cats i've ever worked with um just to be around an animal that size i think is something that not everybody can appreciate um, you know, we're, we're so used to seeing these cats on TV or seeing them on videos online, but when you actually stand next to them and get to work face to face with them, it definitely is a whole other experience. Um, Nikki, you know, fortunately to most of us, unless you're Matt, is very friendly um, or sociable, I wouldn't say friendly. Um, so, you know, it's definitely amazing to get to spend time with her and hang out with her. Um, and I'm just so glad that you guys now through the Explore cameras get to see, you know, a perspective of what we get to see every day. Um, and it always baffles me that for a cat that came from such a horrific start um, can be so great just still and you know still so trusting of people um because i know that's not always the case and i think that makes us feel very special that she does trust us um and yeah she she's definitely one in a million that cat thank you very much you're welcome hi don you are next did you have a question or a comment for lauren you need to unmute your mic in the bottom right hand corner. Okay, I just want to say I appreciate everything y'all do for the cats. My two two top favorites are Kimba and Aria. They Aria stole my heart. Well, and thank she, you. And she's actually my sponsor cat, and I do I make the call to the well seven days a week. They're I know they're going to get tired of me, but it's got to be done. These cats. Is good got be their voice no that's fantastic thank you so much um you know obviously way back in the beginning um when we started doing the call of the world we actually used to do it from a phone in the gift shop um and very quickly when we would let guests use the phone the response that we got from senators and reps from their aides was oh it's just big cat rescue again um, so you guys really don't realize how important it is and how great it is for you to make those calls on your own, make the calls from your personal phones. Um, and we really, really appreciate that. So thank you. No, honestly, years back years ago, I honestly had thought about getting a tiger as a pet. I went through the channels, checked to see what it would take, and then I found y'all and really learned that a big cat's not a good pet. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, and I am very glad that is the decision you made. They belong to the wild, be respected as wild animals they are. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Carol, for everything y'all do. Love you, Don. Thank you. Hi, Bella. Did you have a question or a comment for Lauren? Hi, Lauren. A uh, question for you on the organizations that you're having with, like, with the walkabout and all that we sponsor to help. Which one is the one that you would love to sponsor more and more, whether it's a big cat or a small cat, and why would it be that organization with what they do? And so honestly, I think it would be very hard to pick just one. Um, there are so many great, especially smaller organizations out there um, with, in particular, working with small cats. Um, so I was very fortunate back in 2019 before coronavirus and before travel um, kind of restrictions happened um, to go over to Sri Lanka to a small cat summit. And basically what that was is small cat researchers working on a variety of species around the world met for a it was a three or four day conference where they basically got to talk about their projects talk about what they needed financially talk about the animals that were, that they were working with what they were doing to save them um, and just meeting those people in person I think gave a whole new perspective um, you know these are conservationists that are living out in the field with barely any resources um, that are really trying to do on the ground direct work to protect these animals. You know, they're not sitting in an office in New York or, you know, sitting somewhere um, in luxury and comfort. They are out there every day grinding to work and provide for these cats um, and meeting them and learning about their backgrounds and learning about, you know, what they envisioned in terms of conservation. Um, I think that's really where my focus is now um you know we've all heard of the larger organizations rainforest trust wwf um you know i for all of these facilities that have global acknowledgement and people know the great work they do um but really like these small cat groups and these working groups that the two that we're actually doing for the walkabout um they are conservationists now from different work areas that are grouping together to try and make the conservation more effective so rather than having overlapping uh, programs you now have individuals you know say some in argentina and some in peru and different areas of south america that are now all working together as one big group to try and save a species across the whole country as opposed to just their small area um, and so really, as I say, meeting those people and learning from those people, uh, they are really the ones that need the funding and they are the ones that can do the most with the smallest amounts of funding. Um, and so it's great to have a relationship with them and get to speak to them and find out what they truly need and then uh, help them any way that we can. So um, both the Pampas Cat Project and the Joffrey Cat Project for Walkabout um, are two projects that really, really need the funding, and I feel they're going to do great things with that funding. Okay, thank you very much for answering that. That helped a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, CJ. Did you have a question or a comment for Lauren? Yes, I have two comments. Uh, one already sort of was addressed, but I am one of those people that would be happy just to sit around for an hour and listen to you talk. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful accent. <laughs> it's just fun. Um, but the other thing was, I just wanted to thank you for the supporter videos that you're providing. Um, it is so much fun to see some of them that we don't see very often, and you had one of um, Dryden the other day that absolutely had me in stitches as he was <laughs> staring directly at the camera and being trying to be fierce without actually, I mean, just moving his whiskers forward and you could hear, you could wait, you could see it coming, <laughs> but he was just hilarious. I absolutely loved it. So, and you're getting not lots of... Um, nice comments on um, the ones that I have posted. So I just wanted to say that I really appreciate them and we'll take however many you can send us. 
<laughs> you are very welcome. I must say that um, when Carol approached me about that, I was like, oh, darn, I have to walk around and film cute cats all day. Sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, no, that's, that's definitely, you know, I I always love to share those kinds of videos because, like I said, with Nikki, I feel as though you guys, you know, you know the cats and you get to see the cats, but you don't always get to see the same side of the cats that we see as keepers, you know, seeing them every day. And um, I think one of the comments somebody made on the Flint video was, I've never seen him sit still so long. Yeah, you know, and the, those kinds of comments just make me laugh because, you know, we we as keepers, it's more natural for us to see them like that. And so to share that with you guys and to give you a glimpse into the multiple personalities, you know, Kilona, I think the one you shared today was Kilona's Breakfast. Um, you know, the backstory behind that is some of these cats have us very well trained that if they don't eat their breakfast, they know that we'll take them seconds and it'll be better options. You know, so for for what made a super cute video for you guys was actually just me trying to get her to eat. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm glad you enjoy them, and I, I will continue to provide as many as I can. Well, I am glad to know that you can see them when they're, when they're uh, posted and be able to see the responses to it. And you're right, the, um, the Flint video was, I think I put a caption on it of, Look quick, you're going to see something that Flint never does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, I do, I really enjoy your captions. They're very witty. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We're, we're enjoying the videos. Good. Thank you. Hi, Dawn, the other Dawn. <laughs> Did you have a question or a comment for Lauren? Hi, Debbie. Hi, Carol. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Hi Karen. Hi, Carol. Um, Lauren, um, I wanted to ask for the rehab team, um, Brittany had said that you had stepped down to have her come back. Um, and so can you touch on that? Um, we thought it was like really touching for you to like step down um, to give her a chance. Yeah, um, so I think one of the things about Big Cat that, um, you know, a lot of us really appreciate is that we're essentially one big family, um, you know, and I don't feel as though anybody does anything there for their own gain. You know, everybody is very willing to work together and help out where needed. Um, and I actually was very fortunate to start uh, training on rehab and working with the rehab cats in my level five internship. So that was back in 2015. Um, you know, and over the years, I've still continued to help out. Um, right now, I'm, I'm helping with summer um, and that side of things. But I feel like rehab is one of those skills that um, not everybody gets the chance to learn, but it's definitely a whole other skill set and a different side of, you know, conservation and cat care that everybody should see and should get to enjoy and should get to be a part of. Um, because rehab for me is probably one of the fav one of my favorite programs that we do there. You know, get into work with the cats and see them go back to their wild environment and see cats that came in injured and nurse them through the different stages of health and then let them go and see them be successful. Um, you know, that it, that is definitely something that for me was very life-changing and I think everybody deserves a chance to experience that. Um, so when it came up, you know, that Brittany wanted to join the team, um, I had been on the team the longest so it only made sense for me to step back you know and it wasn't me stepping back because I didn't want to be a part of it anymore it was me stepping back because I wanted to give somebody else that opportunity um and as I said you know I still keep up with the rehab updates um I actually did rejoin the rehab team for a short while and then now our current level five interns are at that point where they are able to learn and to be a part of the program so again you know, I was more than happy to step back and let them take that experience, let them learn those skills 
um, and just really be a part of that because the rehab team I think is a very uh, a special team to be a part of and it's a it's a very close-knit team um, you know obviously we get to take care of animals that not everybody does and so um, we appreciate that you know and we have to try and include as many people as possible and let everybody have their chance um, so yeah I, I you know I at the time I was sad to step down but I also was happy that somebody else was going to get to experience what I had experienced through that program Lauren thank you so much again um, a big you know I'm a big cat uh, fan and follower and I will be the voice for these animals and I will not back down until this bill passes. And yes, I am a fighter. (laughs) Well, thank you. We need, we need people like you out there. So we, we appreciate all of you. Lauren, I think some people may not understand why there's a limitation on how many people can be in the Bobcat rehab program at one time. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, so with the uh, Rehab Bobcats, obviously, they are not coming to us to be permanent residents. Um, They are cats that we want to put out in the wild or back out into the wild. So um, we really don't want them getting comfortable around people. Um, So everything we do with them, we try to do from a distance. You know, we don't want to imprint on them in any way that could affect their chances of survival. Um, So the rehab team is kept to a small number of people to limit exposure, um, but also just to make sure that their level of care, you know, is top notch. Um, everything that we do through the rehab program, we have to make sure that we log, that we have documentation for, um, you know, and obviously it is one of those programs that you can't afford to not do things right. Um, you know, it could affect the chances of this cat being releasable. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, we, we try and keep smaller numbers just so that we can make sure everything's done correctly, but most importantly to ensure minimal imprintation and, um, human effect on the cats. Lauren, this is Karen again. I just have um, one other question. With all of the people that you work with and, and organizations that you work with, was there is there one in particular one that you would say really you were successful um, with, with the donations? Was there one particular place that you could say you would uh, – you would say was a very successful choice on your part that worked well for you and, and for big cats in general? Um, so one organization that we have worked with multiple times on multiple occasions is the Corbett Foundation. Um, that's one that I'm sure that you've heard a lot about and seen through International Tiger Days and whatnot. Um, and they have been incredible in, return, in regards to reporting back to us and, um, you know, keeping us up to date with how they are spending the funds. Um, they actually work out in Band of Guard Tiger Reserve, which is one of the largest reserves in India. Um, and there are, I believe, around 2,500 farm wells that are basically just big, deep wells that have been dug by locals to provide, you know, water to farmers. Um, And these wells have become one of the biggest death traps to animals. The animals fall into the wells and then they're unable to get back out again. Um, So they actually came up with a fairly simple initial initiative just to go around and put like chain link fences around the wells to give a barrier so the animals know where the wells are and to to stop them from falling in. Um, That is a project that we funded for a couple of years. Um, And I think just through our donations alone, um, we've managed to fence in over 100 of those wells. Um, You know, so to see that direct action happening and that uh, direct threat mitigation happening through them has been great to see. Um, And then another initiative that they actually had last year was to help farmers build more predator, um, predator proof uh, cattle sheds. 
So one of the most common problems that people have nowadays with, you know, human-animal conflict and the overlap of people in natural habitats is that, um, you know, the animals see livestock as an easy kill. And so they'll take a cow or a goat or a sheep, which then causes the locals to be upset with the predator. And then you have retaliatory killings where they'll go out and poison them or trap them or kill them. And so, again, Corbett came up with quite a simple initiative that actually a lot of other places use, which is to provide those locals with predator-proof cattle sheds to protect their livestock, which then reduces some of that, um, you know, conflict between the locals and the animals. Um, So those are kind of the projects that I love to see are the direct action projects. Um, You know, you you can plow tons of money into research and finding out where cats live and, you know, what the cats need. But if you're not actively reducing the threats to those animals, you're not really improving their status in the wild. Um, You know, so that's the kind of stuff I really like to see and like to fund is those direct action uh, projects. Yes, those two are very well known, I mean, in our circle, and they are, I'm so glad to hear that they were successful or still working um, with them and moving in the right direction, so that's awesome. Um, I know two other people popped up, so I'm going to hand it back over, but thank you so much for giving us that information. So You're much appreciated. Welcome. So much appreciated. Thank you. Hi, Anne. Did you have a question or comment for Lauren? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Kansu, and uh, I have a comment and a question for Carol, actually. So uh, I like I think what Carol did is really, really inspired, uh, inspirational or inspire, whatever the word is. And I really love what you did, and you helped me went through a lot of hard, uh, hard times. And thank you for what, what you do. So I just have one question for Carol. I just killed my wife and feed her to my dog. Could you help give me some tips for that? Thank you. Yeah, I saw that you guys were not accepting him up onto the stage. And it was like, well, I'm going to give him a try. And he proved himself to be a jerk. So sorry about that, everybody. Luana, did you have a question for Lauren or a comment? Luana? Luana? <laughs> I see her mic is not on. Hello, Luana. Well, did anybody else have any more questions or comments in our last five minutes? And then at the top of the hour, we will all go over to Cameo. And I think Luana has been posting that link all over the place. So thank you very much for that. I can ask one more question as always. We can always depend on me, can't we? Um, sorry, my New Jersey accent comes out when I'm when I'm excited. But I I asked this to our last guest and I would like to see what you think too, just because of how many tours I've been on. Have you noticed a very big difference in the cats um, since no more tours? What what was your observation on that? Um, so I think honestly, initially, um, it was interesting because a number of the cats would still, um, get fairly active around what were the tour times. So like what were the keeper tours or feeding tours, you would see an increase in movement with some of the cats, um, which I always found fascinating. It's like they knew that snacks and treats were coming. Um, but honestly, the, the, having fewer people on the sanctuary grounds i think it gave way for a lot of uh, more um shy cats to come out and spend time out and about um you know and it's it's it was almost like a nice break i feel for the cats for a while just to have quiet and to not have hordes of people coming through um you know obviously we love to share the cats with people and we love to tell people all about them and show them in person. Um, but I, I think it gave Big Cat more of a tranquility than it already had. Um, you know, for a lot of us, 
when we would be there after hours, after tours, five, six o'clock, um, you would see the cats kind of out and um, more more active. Um, and I think in the beginning, we saw more of that. Um, but we also tried to make efforts to, you know, increase enrichment and increase op rent and increase those kinds of activities um, to still keep the cats um what's the word uh still keep them entertained and you know for for a lot of people i don't think they realize that tours a lot of times actually acted as a form of enrichment for the cats you know the the cats were able to see new people and smell new things and hear new voices and target you know different people and stalk different people and so I think when that went away um us increasing our enrichment program and opera program was important um but yeah it, it's weird because I, I think for a lot of the people it was stranger to not have people than it was for the animals thank you Lauren I, I always wonder and I like to get different people's opinions I know we have three people um left but I Deb I'm not sure. I know we have three minutes, so I'm going to hand it over to you to see what we can do because Cameo does begin pretty soon, so not sure. Luana, can you unmic yourself now? Nope. <laughs> How about you, Cassie? Hi, guys. Um, you know, I guess my question for Lauren is, uh, like a lot of other people, Manny happens to be my favorite on property. Um, just terrifyingly mesmerizing. Um, can you share a, a fun Manny story with us? Yeah, so um, Manny actually was uh, one of the first cats um, that made me feel very insignificant and tiny. Um, so I remember actually, um, I went to film him the one day and, uh, I was, I had gone behind the barricade. He was on top of that platform that he loves to sit on. And, um, right as I went to film him, he locked eyes with me and just leaned forward and my heart went so fast and I was like, I have to leave. Like, I'm so uncomfortable right now. Like, I just have to get out of here. Um, and that was the first cat that had ever made me feel that way. And I think it, you know, obviously, we respect the fact that they are wild animals and they are in no way domesticated. Um, but I had never gotten a feeling that intense from a big cat before. Um, and he definitely, uh, yeah, made me uncomfortable. <laughs> Even just hearing the whole lock eyes lean forward, like his posture is yep. intimidating, right? Like he doesn't have to move. He yep. just has to lean a little bit. Yeah, um, it was like he was staring into my soul. And I was like, okay, I have to go now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a, a good point you bring up is it, it really, you know, as, as I'm sitting here, you know, ooing and eyeing over him, it really does give you a new respect for the cats when, when they can make you feel that uncomfortable, even though yes. you know you're safe. Um, 100% yeah. and I mean we um, it's very easy I feel to become complacent when working around these kind of cats and you just cannot afford to you know you have to have it in the front of your mind at all times that they are wild animals they are capable of a lot um, and you just cannot afford to let your guard down um, so you know as, as uncomfortable as it made me it was a good reminder to you know always have that that mindset yeah, I think if anyone on property can give you that reminder, it might be him. 100%. Um, <laughs> thank you. I like that story. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Seven o'clock. Yeah, and I'm over here on Cameo, and it stalled out at one second. Carol, do you want to <clears throat> let the last person ask their question, or do you need to? Do we need to switch over? Um, I'm over on Cameo and it stalled at one second to start. And so if Q wants to go ahead and ask, it'll probably take me that long to figure out why it's not starting. Q, did you have a question or a comment for Lauren? Oh, hi. Hi, guys. Thank you for uh, opportunity, to, opportunity to speak. I just came up on stage because I saw Carol Gaskin and she is 
Oh my God, I'm Team Carol Baskin, by the way, because I watched the show not long ago, and this lady is amazing. So I just wanted to come and say I'm your biggest fan, and I also wanted to say, oh my God, I, I just love how you, um, you know, the beautiful cats you have and how you take care of them, and and, and just because I love I love all cats, right? I'm the uh, I'm the cat I'm the cat man, so to speak. So. Uh, I have uh, just my, my own cat, uh, Bangle, at home, which is not close to the real Bangle, but, but uh, you know, I love cats. I just wanted to ask Carol, does she have any domestic cats like I do at my home, or does she just have wild cats? <laughs> I have two domestic cats at home. They're both feral cats, and um, I absolutely love little cats. So thank you for joining us and your love of cats. And I'm going to have to take Lauren and Deb and leave the room because we're starting over on Cameo now. But thank you, everybody, for joining us here tonight. I so appreciate you being here. Love you guys. Bye, all.